Hi, this is John Reed of Diginomica, and uh, I've managed to commandeer a room, and I've got a guest I've never had before, Joe McKendrick. How you doing? Hi, John. It's nice to be here. Yeah, yeah, we've known each other. I'm not sure where we are. <laughs> we are in an undisclosed location, but the good news for our listeners is it's quiet, which is really nice after the NRF podcast I taped, which was basically in a hallway. So, um, but but just for a little bit of context. Uh, I don't actually do podcasts at every show I'm at. We're at the Maria DB user conference right now, um, but I don't always take conf- you know podcasts at conferences. And the reason is that I can't always find someone interesting enough to talk with. I mostly want to talk with independent voices. Uh, one of the things about about Joe that I like is that when in my reader when, in my ZDNet feed, when there's an interesting article, I'm like, I'll bet Joe wrote that. <laughs> And then a lot of times that is the case. And I'm a sucker for, for a lot of the stuff that you do because you do, like, your most recent title, There's No Ops, there's no ops Like No Ops, The Next Evolution of DevOps. So, I was proud of that title. Yeah, that's not too shabby. <laughs> you spend a song. There's no, op, like, no Ops Like DevOps. Um, no, no, I'm sorry. No Ops Like uh, No Ops. Yeah. No Ops Like DevOps. Yeah, that probably would make a song. I don't know if anyone would listen to it. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, we had kind of a Spinal Tap-like entrance into this room through the back hallways. And, and I want to talk with you a little bit about kind of what drives your, your research. I know you're really, really interested in, in this, something that we spent a lot of time on as well, which is like this sort of friction between IT and business and then the sort of siloed approach to IT. And, um, and so you kind of come up with that in your posts. And sometimes I wish your posts were a little longer because I'm like, oh, Joe, you're just getting going. But that's part of your style. You're able to they say come. short. It has to be short yeah. on the on, uh, Evidently. On the internet. Evidently. <laughs> and, and I'm always like hoping that, that a, like an autoplay video doesn't pop up on ZDNet by the time I finish. But, uh, but yeah, I, I like being on. Yeah, I, li- I like taking the risk of, of, of an autoplay video to read to read your stuff on, on ZDNet. Oh, and I want to start on autoplay. That's that's when I've had peeves. <laughs> yeah, I've been hammering them about it. So hopefully someday they'll they'll listen to me. But who knows? Um, I, I think a couple of browsers are about to prohibit that soon. So maybe that will be our savior. But but anyhow, what I want to talk to you about is basically some of your most recent articles. And in the context of that, uh, just a little more about your thinking because I know that you're you're an independent. And you do a lot of research, and then you compile survey data for clients, and, and you blog. Is That's pretty much what you do, right? Yeah, that about sums it up. I'm yeah. independent because no one would hire me as a full-time employee. Well, so we're unemployable, right? <laughs> we're unemployable. So, <laughs> that's a badge of pride, right? <laughs> so tell me about there's no, no ops like no ops, the next evolution of DevOps. What inspired that post? Craig Nist. I, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll yeah, yeah, yeah we're trying name. to get his name. Yeah, Greg yeah. Nist. Yeah, director Nist. of training at Mark Logic. Yep. Yeah. And just imagine a tech guy with the last name of Nist. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that <laughs> but, is. But he, uh, you know, he offered to uh, provide his thinking to to, to dis- discuss his thinking behind no ops, and uh, um, he's 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 kind of bullish on the on the subject. You know, he sees a lot of potential in uh, the ability to uh, to really enhance developer productivity uh, through a through a, a no ops or uh, something close to a no ops type of uh, scenario in companies. Yeah, and it's interesting because it's. I think he kind of saying that like, yeah, DevOps blending the role of development and operations to increase accountability and speed. But now he's saying, well, what if you kind of take the humans kind of out of some of those loops, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, and I I kind of coined it. I I, I call it a frontal lobe to front office. You know, the developers mm. frontal lobe to front office. In other words, as fast as uh, uh, someone can code or build the software. It can be deployed and moved out to uh, the part of the business where it's required, mm. uh, because b- companies are under so much pressure to get software out there, get the solutions, or, or get the application out to either out to market or out to their workforce or out to their locations as quickly as possible. You know, there's even you know, you know, you, you, it's, it's been often said. I'm sure you heard this many times that it used to take maybe four to six months to uh, put an application out there. Mm. And now it needs to be done within, you know, an afternoon or a, uh, within a couple days. Um, so uh, this seems like the logical next step in uh, really getting software, software that's uh, uh, compliant, that's secure, that's uh, well-built. You know, almost the, the, the software, the so-called fa- software factory effect, I think is what we're seeing uh, happen here. 
And that's been talked about a lot too, software industrialization and the yeah. software factory. Microsoft, I think, had coined that term software factory many, many years ago, and it's it's coming to fruition. Yeah, and you had an interesting contrarian view in that piece from David Linthicum about how legacy systems make no ops and on starter and undermining the people focused premise of DevOps and it you know, his point is it's not just about automation, it's about people working together, which which I kind of like about the whole DevOps DevOps movement is kind of breaking down these silos of various kinds. But but it is interesting. I mean I think you're quick to you're quick to point out that we're not um, you know this isn't some kind of like magical thing that's going to swoop in and and solve these problems now, but but that it's an interesting way to reframe the thinking going forward. Exactly, and it's it always it's always it always comes down to people. It's about people and the way people work together. Mm. You know, you can automate you can automate processes, but ultimately the, the purpose of the automation needs to be to help people do their jobs better, or help companies uh, uh, companies which are collections of people working together to. Uh, do things more effectively for the customers, you know, uh, ideally, in an ideal world. Yeah, and appropriately enough, we're at a, we're at a data show because the next piece I have up here is data, data integration issues still impeding digital progress survey shows. Uh, yes. And, you know, I think this is an issue you hit on a lot in terms of the, the obstacles to digital transformation. And it seems like we come back to these same themes a lot. And you here you were riffing on a survey by... By progress, uh, which found that data integration is the number one challenge for enterprises looking to sort of expand their digital. What, what did you make of that? Well, you know, it, it, it's, it, it goes back to um, you have, you know, we've had all this happy talk for, uh, you know, a number of years now about the digital enterprise, how wonderful the digital enterprise is going to be. Now it's, it's translating to artificial intelligence, machine mm-hmm. learning, you know, how wonderful things are going to be. We're going to be able to serve our customers faster and and uh, more effectively, and, and, and the companies are going to run smoother and operationally more efficient because we have AI and ML machine learning, and uh, they're digitally, uh, you know, they, they have digital channels and digital technologies. But you need that infrastructure to support it. You need that, uh, you know, somewhat boring stuff. Uh, you know, how are you going right. to store the data? How are you going to manage the data? How are you going to bring this data together? Uh, it's, it's, there's all this work that needs to go on behind the scenes, and uh, you know, it's 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 not magic. Uh, it may seem like magic, you know, as Arthur C. Clarke said, right? Uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and we're getting to that point. But there's a lot of hard work that has to go behind it, and, and part of that is the data integration. Yeah, I was just looking at some of these, like listing some of the different challenges, like data spread across an increasing number of data sources, 47%. You can see that in the proliferation of device data, et cetera. Integrating cloud data with on-premise data, 40, 44%. Then dirty data, data inconsistencies. And so all these problems, right? And you can see why this is such an obstacle because transformation can't really happen in a silo, right? You can't. You can't serve your customers with only part of the data of what their interactions are. You have to see it all if you're going to have a real impact on their lives in a way where they would say, wow, this firm is making a difference. They're, they're really changing now. Um, exactly. So, and, and so I think the interesting thing about this post is you kind of you, – you, you paint a little bit of a dire picture of some of these challenges and then you stop and say, well, what are we going to do about it? And, and then – one of the answers that you put forth here is around standardization as a, as a possible way of addressing that, including yeah. REST. So uh, starting to see a little more of that maybe, a little more of an adherence to protocols. We're getting there. And, you know, we, we, we first started tackling that issue way back when, uh, you know, when we had uh, web services and, and service-oriented architecture, uh, mm. those approaches. REST, REST is kind of an offshoot of uh, SOA. Right. Um, and you and you start to see kind of the hipper, with, younger <laughs> yeah. offspring of, of SOA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, faster, lighter, and uh, right, <laughs> less stodgy. We but, like so we so true. these concepts have been around for a while. These concepts but. have been around for a while, and and you know actually that holy grail of having a uh, data, this one source of, source of truth that the entire enterprise could tap into. That's been around for decades now. You know, data warehouses mm-hmm. were first conceived, what, back in the 1980s and 1990s? Yep. Um, and that, that attempted to address that search for the one version of the truth. And, and we're still, organizations are still searching for that. To give you an illustration, just a couple years ago, um, 
I was getting uh, I was getting letters from my health insurer asking. It's a letter I sent out to apparently to all the members asking for their status with Medicare. Are they available for Medicare yet? You know, mm-hmm. five. I'm not quite there yet. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking, gee, you know, my health insurer has two million members. They probably sent out two million letters. You know how much that costs to send out two million letters asking them if they're ready for yeah. Medicare. And if anybody should know my age, anybody's age, it should be the health insurer, right? Right. <laughs> like, why aren't they those still systems? Don't know. Yeah. Well, and I think what's interesting about this is it, it points back to your one of your core themes, I think, in your in your writing, which is the sort of that business and IT need each other, and they might have a slightly dysfunctional relationship, but they can't walk away from it. Yeah. And and I think this kind of points that out, right? Because the the business might have a transformational objective to change into a customer centric business, but without this data and solving these back end data problems, that's not going to happen. So. Yeah. Uh, another example, a personal example. Um, you know, telecoms. You think are ahead of the curve. You know, they're all about technology. Right. A couple of years ago, I moved offices, and I notified my telecom provider. Um, I won't divulge them, but they're, it starts with a V. <laughs> and uh, I can guess. Yeah. <laughs> You know, they, they disconnected my previous line and they, they reconnected me at my new office, right, which was uh, downstairs in the same building. However, the bills, my bills, my monthly bills kept going, getting mailed to the old office. Like, if anybody should know my new address, it should be the folks that installed my my telephone and FIO service at right. the new address. <laughs> but and, and I kept calling them. I kept writing them notes. And the bill stuff still kept on going to the old office, and the new tenants were just kind of throwing the bills away. It's like, what? What? <laughs> what, what happened? Where's the disconnect there? And potentially, it's a, that's a little bit daunting, right? Because if if this big telecom that begins with a V um, can't solve that problem, then then how are a lot of companies going to solve it? You would think they would have the resources to. Yeah, they would have the resources. They have the data. They have the information right there. What, what, you know, they should have a single view of the customer, and apparently they don't. Their billing department is separate from their service department. Yeah, and the data apparently the data doesn't uh, cross over. Another really interesting thing. Um, I won't spend too much time on this one because we'll wrap fairly soon. But I, the, you had another interesting recent piece on. Even for DevOps teams, troubleshooting still gets in the way of higher value activities, which, again, you were looking at a survey, which is often how you kind of, I think, start your riffs, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, in, this, in this case from SolarWinds. But, but the, the thing that I thought was really interesting there is that so, so much of what we think of as cutting-edge IT, the, the core goal behind it should be to move people into more strategic roles of various kinds, right? Right. So the, the, the hype is that it's about automating and getting rid of people. But I think to a large extent, at least in the short window of the three to five year horizon, a lot it's really more about finding a way to shift people into more strategic roles, right? Whether exactly. it's more customer facing stuff or building more differentiating apps for businesses or whatever it is. But yet what we're finding from data like this is that so much of this time is still gobbled up. You might even be a cool on a cool DevOps team, but if you're According to this survey, you're spending 53% of your time troubleshooting. That's you're not as strategic as one as you might like, right? You're, yeah, you're firefighting, and that's what's right. still going on. It's firefighting. It's the maintenance. Um, you know, there's the, there's so, there, there's numbers out there that uh, was a 75% of all the IT budgets are focused on maintenance uh, versus the the cool new stuff, the customer facing stuff. Right. And that's a that's a big issue, especially with uh, companies with uh, legacy systems. And there's a lot of companies with so-called legacy systems. And and nothing against legacy systems. A lot of them are functioning just fine. You know, the IBM uh, System Z is a uh, you know an amazing machine. And then and then uh, again, you're kind of like, well, what do we do about this? And and the report um, generated a few ideas. One is that it's about culture change, not just technology, which I think resonates. I think across so many projects, right? Put out fires before they start is another one, and uh, uh, which involves the use of application management tools and APM tools and such to try to identify troubles ahead of time and then doubling down on automation. And one thing I thought was interesting about that, oh, and building institutional knowledge was another, another one on the list. So, you know, these are not easy things to do, but one thing I found interesting on automation is that this came up in the 
in an open works conversation we had today with a customer about how one of the things they took from this show last year was a presentation where a fellow customer said that one of their rules was anything that takes you longer than 30 minutes on our team, you find a way to automate it. And they said they heard that last year, and they took it back to their company, and their managers really liked it and made that a little bit of a guiding principle. I don't know if they had input it exactly the same way, but it was the same concept, which is like become mindful of the things you're doing that are time-consuming, and then the process of automating that becomes a priority. And I think it's, help, it's helpful to have that from a management perspective because you might think, well, yeah, that's a good idea, but if you don't have the support of your management, then when they ask you what you're doing and you tell them you're writing a script to automate something, you need their support that that's what you're doing with your, you know. Exactly right. And, so. and you know something, John? Uh, you know, IT people, developers, programmers, um, managers, uh, they're, they're great at what they do. I mean, uh, they build incredible systems, but they're not trained to be to run businesses for the most part. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't. In, in, in college, uh, in tech school, or wherever, uh, you know, the, the, the training isn't really about running a business, negotiating, uh, planning strategic directions. You know, and and, and we're we're turning to our IT people, especially with the digital era now. We're we're saying to our IT people, come on, help us go digital, help us become a digital enterprise. And uh, you know, IT people are fine with that, but uh, you know, they they they, they simply don't have the the background, hmm. the the training. Um, Right. To uh, to to assist with this process, you know. Likewise, just as a uh, you know, a CEO probably doesn't have a whole lot of computer training other than knowing how to work out a mobile yeah. phone. <laughs> and we could probably do a whole podcast on that whole thing around sort of the the combination of skills that today's yeah. savvy professionals. Yeah, but we're throwing you know, a lot on the IT department. We're we saying are. the IT department transform us. Come on, we're not going to give you more budget, but transform yeah. us. Come on, let's go, IT. Yeah, it's a lot to ask. Yeah, my 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 much derided liberal arts education really helped me with some of that stuff, but it didn't provide me with the technical background. Whereas a lot of people that I meet at these shows, they have the technical background, but they they lack a lot of the capabilities to see across their functions to others. And so it's interesting. I, I don't yeah. think we really have to find how we train and educate this new professional. Yeah. We're just yeah, in the beginning stages of that. Yeah. I mean, it's coming a little bit close. You know, people talk about the IT business divide, and, and that may have been the case years ago. But it's coming a little bit close. You know, the, the people who are coming into management now are uh, millennials or maybe Gen X, and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they've, they've been around computers for a long time, so they understand the power of computing and understand what computing can do. You know, likewise, IT is, is getting savvier. You know, there's the pre- as I said, the pressure's on IT, you know, and uh, so they're, they're getting savvier about the business. So the two sides are coming closer, um, and perhaps, perhaps there will be a convergence at some point, you know, uh, but uh, uh, it's, 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 it's difficult now to, uh, you know, again, you know, we, we, we want our businesses to run on technology. Every business wants to be a software business now, you know, GM, Ford, Right. Uh, you know, Mrs. Smith's pies. You know, every every company wants to be a software Absolutely. company. Chick Fil A, according Chick-fil-A. to my <laughs> Tableau user <laughs> event that I went to and wrote about. So everyone wants to. How do you do it, right? Yeah, how do you do it? Which and, I think- uh, you, you know, you, you need your IT people to step up, and uh, they're happy to do so. But they need that training. They need that uh, that that business uh, background as well. And, and so I think that brings us to just about our stopping point. But just a brief word on, on MariaDB OpenWorks. We're still in the middle of the first day, so we can't really say a whole lot yet about this show. But I did want to make the observation, having interviewed a couple of customers today, that I think one of the big themes, there's two big themes that are jumping out at me here at this conference. One is that all of these transformational products do come back to the nitty-gritty of data, and so that's why these database shows, I think, are important. Um, yep. And then doing more with less is a big theme here, you know, because when you talk to a lot of customers, a lot of them are using various large, expensive, so-called legacy databases. We won't name names. Mm-hmm. Not all of them would consider themselves legacy either, but the point is low-cost open-source alternatives are often the beginning of this quest. Mm-hmm. Where that ends up, I think becomes a bigger, interesting conversation because ultimately it's not just about cost, right? It's about how you're going to change your business. But I think it's interesting how you talk about doing more with less. I think that's where a lot of this this sort of so-called open source movement like picks up some steam as far as, yeah, I can save money and have the same type of performance. Then the question becomes where do you go from here? And I think that's the question I want to hear more about 
in the next day. So hopefully I will. And it's so. interesting too, John, that I, I heard this stat this morning about 24% of, I think of their customer base uses their services via cloud or a, a yeah. data, a database of service, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, you know, a few years ago that would have been unimaginable. Right. The thought of uh, accessing data, having data out in the cloud, it, it's right. now commonplace to the point where the database companies aren't sending out their uh, disk uh, yep. and installing on customer sites. They're now running da- their database as, as, a, as a service, their, as a cloud service. Yeah, and very interesting talks with customers here about their, you know, they're more skeptical about cloud adoption amongst the group here because a lot of them are hardcore database administrators that are used to running on bare metal. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, they're looking at microservices and they're, they're thinking about the possibility of using cloud and microservices architectures kind of go together, right, because you think about, you know, elasticity and being able to quickly run up a new service or, you know, and, and, and have that available to you in a way that you can't on-premise. But it's interesting, and I think what I do take away is that that you, and I, I saw some criticism of MariaDB for on Twitter for not moving fast enough with their database as a service and their cloud-based approaches. But in the end, like those conversations are happening here, and I think that's interesting to see the the customers themselves are kind of grappling with that. And even if they're more cloud averse or cloud hostile, even than a lot of customers I'm used to seeing at like cloud ERP shows and stuff, they're mm-hmm. thinking about it and they're yeah. aware that that there there are reasons for that. It's it's not just hype, they're but they are being careful. So 